name is Melissa Jeter, Librarian Specialist for the Art Tatum African American Resource Center, located in the Kent Branch of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Welcome to the Art Tatum African American Resource Center's Oral History Project, the Adrienne Cole Collection. Dr. Adrienne Cole was a local African American historian and educator who began collecting the stories of noteworthy Toledoans in the African American community. With this oral history project, the Art Tatum African American Resource Center honors her memory and her work. Join me and University of Toledo Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Willie McCather, as Toledo's very own African Americans share the stories of their lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Willie McCather. In this segment, we're pleased to welcome Ms. Mary Gregory. Ms. Gregory, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Ms. Gregory, you were born in 1930 in Marion, Indiana. Correct. And later moved to Toledo in the early 1940s. Right. Your life is historically significant for a number of reasons, but particularly because you're the first African American to graduate from a school of nursing in Toledo. That's correct. And secondly, because your mother, Elizabeth Booker, established one of the earliest um, beauty salons in Toledo, Booker's Beauty Box. Correct. Great. Let me go back. Now, so, so because you were not born in Toledo, um, and you came here when you were about 12 years old, let's go back and talk about what was happening with you and your living arrangement up until the point in which you moved here. Um, I know at some point your mother and your aunt moved to Toledo, um, while you were raised by your grandmother in Indiana. Correct. Can you explain a little bit about what was going on there? Well, first of all, I was one of those um, babies of the Depression. Okay. And money was certainly hard to come by, even though we had a farm in the country in Indiana. Okay. So my mom and her sister moved into Toledo with a couple, a white couple, okay. who needed a cook and a babysitter. Okay. So doing that, they moved here with this couple worked for them and they could send back money to Marion to help take care of the bare essentials there. Okay. So my mother left me as her sister left her daughter okay. in Marion and we were raised by our grandparents. Okay. And that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. It really was because every summer we went to the to the farm in the country. Okay. And did a lot in terms of, you know, hoeing and weeding and stuff like that. Okay. So it was a very nice existence. I can imagine. So you, so you have, you've been, you've experienced both sides of the fence then. That is correct. So, okay. Were you ever concerned about your mother not coming to get you oh, while never. she's in Toledo? No, never. Um, we always had fantastic holidays. Christmas times, there was always gifts up the wazoo. Okay. Um, the, I was raised with this cousin who was my same age. Okay. So I was really always raised with a first cousin, and we always got along well. Um, my mom, my grandmother worked in day, day work, so okay. she would go to work every day and come home every evening. Okay. And my dad took care of the farm and raised the animals, but we lived in, in, in Marion. In Marion, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, let's move forward a little bit then. Um, you moved to Toledo with your grandparents. My mother's... My, my grandfather's sister lived here in Toledo. Okay. And so each summer, I would come to Toledo to stay with her okay. and then be with my mother. Okay. And that worked out very conveniently also. Okay, good. Now, so uh, there came a point in which you moved here permanently. That is correct. And who'd you live with then? I lived with my mom. Okay. And we lived in the Brand Whitlock Homes because okay. they had just been built. And as I was visiting in the summer, I could see the stages of them, you know, begin being completed. Okay. So when I moved here to Toledo, I lived in the Brand Whitlock Homes, as most of our friends did at, those t at that time, and went to school at Gunkel. At Gunkel. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back. What was the Brand Whitlock, what was that living arrangement like there in, in that? Well, in first, all the homes were new because they'd just been built. Okay. I think most of the friends and people that I met and knew there are ones that I still know today because we're still in Toledo. Okay. So it was a very, very nice place. Everything was new, everything okay. was clean. Uh, the families were close and it worked to be a very warm community. There was not the kind of um, crimes and all that kind of things that there happens to be going on today. Okay, okay, good. Um, I, I didn't get, tell me your grandparents' names. My grandparents were Elizabeth and Wayman Wallace. Okay, okay, good. My grandmother was part uh, Blackfoot Indian. Is that right? Mm -hmm. On your mother's side? On my mother's side. Is that right? Yes. 
wow, okay. Well, good, good. Um, so once you moved here, you, you attended Gunkel School. That is correct. Okay, what other schools did you attend? I Toledo? went to um, Robinson Junior High School for one year, okay. and then I went to Libby because we had moved out of the Brand Whitlock Homes by that time, and I was in the Scott District. But because I was a, a junior senior, they let me stay where I had been. Okay, okay. So you're attending schools in Toledo. Yes. What kinds of things um, did you do socially as you were growing up here? Um, as I look back on that, I see that I had what I'm gonna call kind of a perfect childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I was an only child. Okay. My mom worked, but off times she worked at home in her kitchen okay. because there were not off times beauty shops available, though she did work in a beauty shop too. Okay. So you had the neighbors and you had the mothers of your friends. So everybody looked out and watched out for you. My mother being a beautician was an advantage because many of them had her as their beauty uh, person. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it just was a very close knit area. What did I do? I did everything. My mother believed, I've decided this in my older age, that you have to keep a person busy, especially okay. a child. Okay. So I was. Okay. Uh, I went to day camps through the Y. I went through church where I was very active and sang in the choir and ushered and taught Sunday school and all those kinds of things. And this was done with my normal circle of friends because all of us sort of lived there together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just kept you a very busy, po positive activities which was good. Okay. And you told me earlier that your mother made it a point to keep you busy. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> First of all, my mother worked as I did my dad. Okay. So I had to do a lot of the housework, which okay. was not a real big deal because there were only the three of us there. Sure. But sure. I had to mop the floors every Saturday and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to always have her around. Mm -hmm. uh, we always got along very well. Okay. Uh, my dad too, which was an advantage. So it worked out very well, and I think you don't think about what is your childhood like until you get older and look back on it. But I think mine was really very, very good. Yeah, good childhood. And the other thing that I liked was that I was going to Gunkel School mm -hmm. in Indiana, where I went to school. There were about five black students. It was that scarcely populated with sure. people that looked like us. Sure, sure. And Gunkel was a school that had black teachers, which I had not ever seen. It had classes that taught about black history, which I had never known anything about. Wow. And so it was a much more enriching area okay. than perhaps if I had stayed in Indiana. Sure. Must have been somewhat of a cultural shock oh, for no you question. as well. Yeah. But I think it was a tremendous advantage because it wasn't anything unusual to be around mostly non-black people. Sure. Because there weren't that many in Indiana. Indiana. Okay. Well, how about church? What role did the church play? I went to church. Oh, I, I couldn't get along without that because I had to go to church every Sunday. Even when I lived in Marion, we lived across the street from a church. It's not the church that my grandparents belonged to. Okay. But my grandparents always paid dues. Mm -hmm. The church that they belonged to was out in the country. Okay. So, but I went across the street to the Methodist church. Had okay. a good time. They had all the activities for kids. And those are the things that, as you look back, are very, very important. When I moved to Toledo... Uh, my aunt was going to a church, which I went to, small church, storefront church, very nice. Um, I was able to help teach Sunday school and anything else that needed to be done. Okay. And of course, obviously, my mother thought that was a good idea, too. Kept you busy. It kept me busy. <laughs> I ended up joining Third Baptist, which was a very large, I guess one of the largest black churches in the city. Okay. And so they had multiple activities, singing in the choir, ushering, and all the kinds of things mm -hmm. that you need to learn how to behave, how to act, and what to do in a crowd. Okay. So I had had to do some things, such as announcing the speaker of the whatever, and scared to death, of course. <laughs> but I look back on that and think of how valuable an experience it was because not only were you around your friends and people that you knew, mm -hmm. but you felt very comfortable and so you got over it. Okay. And okay. I think that that helped a lot as I grew older. Sure. But it sounds like going, going to church wasn't an option. You, you, oh, you no. did it. I used to cry if I couldn't go to church across the street in Indiana. Wow. Because I just always went. That's just the thing that you always did. There wasn't even a question about it. My grandmother didn't go to church a lot because she worked all the time, took Sundays out to get the house cleaned and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think it was a valuable time to grow and instill in you some of the values of living. And again, black people lived in their area. Mm -hmm. 
So prejudice and those kinds of things did not really cause. You knew where you could go. You knew where you couldn't go. There sure. was no problem. Sure. So it just worked out every now and then. There was a black film that came to Indiana, and everybody went to go see it. And it was just a very kind of community-oriented situation. Okay, okay, good, okay. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk specifically about your mother's career as a beautician. Oh, she was fun. Um, she finished school in uh, Cleveland. And she was, uh, she wasn't the valedictorian. She was the second one down from that. Oh. If you aren't the valedictorian, you're salutatorian. So, yes, no. yes. She was very good. Okay. Uh, the fun that I liked about that is that when she went to take her test to see if she could get her beautician's license, she had to take a model with her. Okay. Well, now you know who the model was. <laughs> That's be you, right? So I really enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed the experience. Okay, of, good. And I usually hung pretty tightly to her. We would do a lot of things together, which was really a bad okay, okay. So sh I went to Cleveland to take the test with her. Okay. And I was her model, and you know she washed my hair and had to do all these things to it. Okay, good. But that but was fun. Let me go back. So as she's working in Toledo doing day work, was she also attending school as well? No. She gave up her day work, and she talked with the couple that had hired her and said that she would come back to them, but that she wanted to go to school. Okay. So they said yes and that when you get finished, you are welcome to come back. Okay. Well, when she finished school and was wanting to get going, mm -hmm. she, she talked with the couple, mm -hmm. and they said, no, we would not hold you to that commitment. So they allowed her to give up that day work job, okay. and she could work only on or, with beauty work. beauty work. Now, the fun of that is that she did hair in the kitchen. Let me start with What year did she get her license or graduate? Um, I must have been about 12 or 30, uh, I'd say 10 or 12. So, so about 1942, yes. 43 in there yeah. somewhere? Okay. And she got her license okay. and began doing work in the kitchen. Now you've got an audience with you, you have people all over the neighborhood that come to your kitchen to get their hair done. Okay. So it worked out really well. Okay. But I think many of our people began in places like kitchens and homes and things like that. Sure, sure. She did get to work in a beauty shop, Mary Bell Sheely. She was the piano teacher, excellent piano teacher. Okay. And so she worked in her beauty shop. That was the first shop that she ever worked in. Okay. And from then on, she went into several others. She went into one. My, my grandfather, my dad's father, had a home and had a very lovely big area on the back and he turned it into a beauty shop for her. Okay. So then she worked there. That block, that house was a block from where we moved to out of the Brand Whitlock home. So that was a very convenient location. Okay. And she continued to do her hair. Okay. So she just built up quite a clientele. And the, the name of, of a first business was? Just Booker's Beauty Shop. Okay. She didn't name, put box on the end until she built her own. Okay. So now, what, what caused her then to move out of that smaller location to build her own then? She had wanted, when she moved into uh, her father-in-law's beauty shop, uh, there were things that she wanted to do and he saw no need to improve or do anything. He mm. wanted to sort of stay like it was. Okay. And so she decided that unless she could get her own, she would always be under someone else's control. Sure. And she could not progress like she wanted to. Okay. So it was during the, I um, uh, can't call the name of it, the city had fab, had lots, okay. and they found, she and my dad found this particular lot that they wanted to build a beauty shop on, so they did. Okay. And we were talking not too terribly long ago, and it was the first beauty shop built. Now, and many beauty shops. Okay, let's be clear. There were yeah. other beauty shops. Oh, a lot of them in the people city. People in their homes oh, and yeah, storefronts. Yeah. But this is, you're saying this is one of the first ones that was actually constructed. Built from scratch okay. on its own lot. Okay. And that was over where Mount Pilgrim Church is right now. Okay. Then the city came and took the lot, as the city does. Mm -hmm. So then they had to move where they are now, or where she has now. Okay. And they, of course, therefore, she kept her clientele. Okay. And the shop had four or five different operators in it. Did it really? Oh, yeah. And it was very, it was a very, uh, well, I'm going to be prejudiced, but it was a very friendly, warm shop. You didn't hear a lot of gossiping. I mean, obviously there was a lot of talking, mm -hmm. but it worked out very well. My mother was a very active woman in the community. She had become the president of the Ohio Beauticians Association. There was, a, as you know, we had our own individual whatever, mm -hmm. but she did become the 
president okay. of the Ohio Beautician. Is she really? Oh, yeah. Okay. She was known as an excellent weaver. She taught weaving in okay. the beauty culture school. Okay. So there was a complete series of educational opportunities for her. Okay. And so she kept growing in her, in her profession. Wow. Now, so let me clear, give me the addresses again of each of the, the beauty shops. Beauty shops. Um, the, one, the first one that they, the first, oh, the first one was on Hawley which was behind her father-in-law's home. Okay. And that was at 1001 Woodland Avenue. And on the back of that is where that extra building was built. Okay, okay. Then they moved from there to the one that was on where Mount Pilgrim Church is. Okay. And I can't remember the address. Was it 1101? That, I, don't, I don't remember the exact address. Okay. Then the second one that they built is still standing and it is now still a beauty shop. Uh, it's called Genesis, and they sold it shortly after she retired. And I didn't think that she would ever do that. I now, just thought it was great, but she did. Now, what year did she retire? When she was 85. Wow, so she did hair up until oh, yeah. the point. Oh, she certainly. really? Oh, yeah. She just did hair all the time. She would do the hair of her clients if they died. That was just sort of her gift to the family. Was she? So when people died, she would go do their hair at the mortuary. Was she really? Oh, yeah. Um, she was a very, very warm, friendly, giving person. It's the way she was raised. And so she, again, she was very, she'd pick up her clients that didn't have ways to get there, or my dad would for her. Okay. Uh, but it was a very, uh, I don't know, it was just a very warm, friendly atmosphere. My mother played bridge. I have to tell you that. Because in Indiana, you lived in the country. What did you have to do? <laughs> Nothing. So in the evenings, they would play bridge. Okay. And she was an excellent bridge player. She really? But I think even better than that, and I've heard, I was at a skating rink, and this gentleman came to me and he said, are you Miss Booker's daughter? I don't have a name. I'm her daughter, mm. which is wonderful. I just love that. And I said, yes. He says, you know, I've never heard anyone say an unkind word about your mother. Really? And I thought, Oh, okay. I had not either, obviously, but I'm sure. just saying that she had a, a very positive reputation. Okay. She also was a Republican, okay. and she worked for the Republican Party. And in that shop that she built that is now still standing, mm -hmm. there was an additional part built that was ended up being rented out to the Republican Party really? as an office. Wow. Okay. So I'm saying it to say that she was as active in the community as she was in her church. She was active there, too. So she wasn't just taken out of the community. She was given something oh, back. Oh, yeah, all the time. It's very important. Yeah, all the time. And it sounds like the two of you were very close. Yes. Um, I guess sort of like two peas in a pod. And as busy as she was, she certainly needed help. You know, she'd have lunches and she'd have parties and she'd have stuff. And certainly I was always there to help out. So it let you learn things that you would not normally have learned about, you know, how to set tables and how to usher and how to do things, mm -hmm. even in a home setting. Sure. Okay, let me, let's switch gears a little bit. Now, as your mother was a wonderful beautician, why did you not follow in her footsteps? She told me she didn't want me to. When I was getting near in high school, and what are you going to be, what are you going to do, because there was never a question that you were going to do something. <laughs> um, and in talking that over, she said, I don't want you to be a beautician. Really? The work is too hard. Okay. By that time, there was a lot of the straightening and the smoke and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And she said, beauty work is too hard. So she said, I don't care what you decide you want to be, but I don't want you to be a beautician. I never thought about it a lot one way or the other. Sure. So then we talked, and I said, well, you know, maybe I'll just be a nurse. And she said, well, that's fine. Why don't you go to work <laughs> <laughs> and be a nurse's aide? Sure. And then you'll know whether you like nursing or not. Okay. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> so I went to work at Riverside Hospital, okay. which is no longer a hospital anymore, and worked there in the OB department which of course was wonderful because they delivered babies. Now what could be better than delivering Little those baby. cute little babies? Can't beat that. So I worked there for um, I think over a year. Loved it. Had a real good time. Okay. And then when it was time to apply for uh, admission into a school of nursing, I knew that there had not been any blacks accepted. Didn't make any difference to me. I was just dumb. About what year are we talking now? That was in 46. 1946. Yes. Okay. Um, and four other classmates of mine, we all went out together. We all wore our white blouses, our dark skirts, our low heel <laughs> shoes, so we looked the part. So Looking very not, appropriate. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we knew how we were supposed to look because our parents told us that, or and the teachers. There was no question as to what you look like when you go out to apply for a job. Okay. So we went in, okay. and 
in some of the schools, they wouldn't even accept us into a private room. They talked to us out in the waiting room. Now you say us, just the five of the us. Five black, the five black female black, students. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, and then in St. Vincent was one that ushered us into a private room and said, um, have you applied anywhere else? And of course, by that time we had. And what did you find? And we told them that, you know, we had not even been accepted to talk to the directors at the time. So <clears throat> she said, well, I'm sorry, but we cannot say that you can come here either. So but the five of us left, and we all went to UT. Let me just stop answering your question, but have they reviewed your credentials, your grade point averages, or anything like that? Two of the students that went with me to apply ended up becoming pharmacists. And one became the director of pharmacy. That was a black female, which was also unheard of. Mm -hmm. The others became teachers. So what I'm saying is, as far as, they didn't get to reviewing credentials. Okay. They didn't even want to see your credentials, because they were already told, we can't take you into the school. Okay. And the reason was because in those days, you had to live in the school of nursing. Now, a lot of the rooms were double rooms. Uh, a few were even four. But most of them were single rooms, so it was no big deal that you were in a single room. But, but, but also, is, is it true that during that time, the nursing schools were located in the hospitals? The nursing schools were attached to hospitals, and the hospitals had schools of nursing so that the students had to live physically on that campus. Okay. And that is exactly why they didn't want us to live with their white students. Okay. So what did you do then after you applied to the St. Vincent's? Yes. And what, what happened then? I went to UT and had a wonderful time. Did you? My parents enjoyed the students who would come home to my house because many of the kids were from out of town. My dad really enjoyed it because he did not go to college, so he did not really go through finished high school. Mm -hmm. So he enjoyed the kids. Uh, I know I did. Uh, one of the things that we did when I was a student is, you don't even remember this, you're too young, but there was <laughs> a, that was a time of Arthur Godfrey. So every Wednesday night, I could take home to my house with me. My parents would pick us up to watch Arthur Godfrey. On television. Oh, that was a big deal. Oh, <laughs> listen, that was just the high. And I think, I don't want to say this, but I think that I was probably one of the only students in the school that had a TV. Wow. At home. At home. At home. Sure. So every week, we would go to watch Arthur Godfrey. So, so that, but you didn't have a TV in your room? Your no, 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 room? no, 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 no. So what did students do without a television? You what? had homework. <laughs> it was no big deal. <laughs> but the time they gave you all your work to do, you didn't miss the TV. <laughs> but it was nice to get out at least once a week. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, we, um, so I had a lot of friends uh, in the school. I think I did anyway. The nun told me when we went in that if the next year that I went back, the other four students were already in college and they were not wanting to go into nursing. Okay. I went back by myself. Back to? Back to St. Vincent. Okay. And the nun said to me, you look familiar. You look like I should know you. And I said, yes, I was here last year in the same skirt and the same blouse <laughs> applying then. And she said to me, she says, you know, I'm sorry. I cannot give you any more encouragement. However, I want you to take these papers home. Don't do anything with them because I still can't say that you can come to the school. So I said, fine, and I left. Okay. So the Friday before a Monday, I was to be in the School of Nursing by 4 o'clock. Now, that meant you had to get your credentials together. You had to get your uh, letters you have reference. You had to get the letter from your pastor. You had to get your dental work done. You had to get a physical done. You had to get all these things done over a weekend. Wow. It worked. Well, let me just ask you, what? What was the significance of getting a letter from your pastor? They had wanted to know what kind of a religious orientation I had. Now, they didn't say I had to be Catholic, but they wanted to know, you know, if I went to a church. Okay. And I got the letter and took it all to them at one time. And Monday by 4 o'clock, I had all my little goodies together, and we all came in at the same time. So you were ultimately accepted? I was ultimately accepted. Would it have been like 1947? Uh, yes. Okay. That's about the time. About the time. Because I graduated in 51 and it's a three-year program. Okay. So then, you, so then you get accepted into the program. What was the experience like as you're going through the program? Um, 
Remember I told you that I was raised in an area where there were very few blacks. So that was not a big deal to have white folks all over the place because that was what Marion was like. Mm -hmm. And of course in your rearing you know where you do and don't go, where you stay and don't stay. Mm -hmm. And so prejudice was nothing that was unusual to me. But, now, but in the dorms, did you stay by yourself? Or I stayed in a roommate? room by myself, as most of my classmates were in rooms by themselves. So okay. that was not unusual. Okay, okay. I mean, on the corner of the hall, there were always double rooms, but that was no big deal at all. You didn't feel different. Okay, okay. So help me, so then you said that the, the first, the, the living quarters was mm -hmm. on the top floor, is that correct? They had five floors of rooms for students. Okay. And certain students were on certain floors. I was on four because that was the usually the floor of the lower class, the first class students. Okay. Sure, sure. And then as um, you're there a year or so longer, then they'll move you to different places. Different places. Okay. But it was no big deal. It was no, not a problem. Okay. Okay. Well, good. So then as you're going through, how did other students, doctors, administrators, how did they treat you? They treated me fine. Okay. I don't feel that I had any problems at all with any of the students. There were enough students there that there were those who liked me, and if those didn't, I don't know who they were anyway. So it didn't really make any difference. <laughs> and they liked to go watch Arthur Godfrey. So it was, so it was good. So that then. worked out, yeah, worked worked out, out well. nicely. Okay, yeah. okay, good, good. No, I did not have what I considered to be any real big problems with the students, and I had even fewer with the doctors. However, it was interesting because as a, as a student, you had to wear this white uniform and you had your name sewn on your pocket. So my name was Miss Mary, no, no, Miss M. Booker. Mm -hmm. There were some white gentlemen who refused to call me Miss Anything. Now, if you were called out of your name, you were subject to being penalized in that you could not leave campus. They would say, put her on campus because something she didn't do. Sure. So, at those times, I would make sure that I told my supervisor so that if she heard someone call me Mammy or Mandy or whatever, as was sometimes the case. Really? She would, oh yeah, she would know that it wasn't that I precipitated that, but that that was what this particular person had decided to do. So I did not um, have that often, but it did occur enough times. But again, like I said, you know those things as you're growing up. So in a way, though, it sounds as if your being reared in Indiana prepared you. I would say so. I would say so. I'd say you're exactly right. Okay. Okay. But now, I want, I want to continue on your, your nursing career. Oh, uh, and then I have to tell you when I went to surgery. Now, you know, you have to rotate through all these various specialties as a student. Okay. Well, I was one of the first, I was in the first group that went to surgery, scared to death. But that was all part of the rotation. Sure. And the one thing that I discovered there is that you know, you're handing instruments and you're assisting the doctor, so you're right in his face, literally. Mm -hmm. And there was a small, slight belt anesthesiologist. Very nice, I always thought he was. And he'd always start asking me questions. What's a normal red blood count? Well, I thought, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when we were through with the surgery, he said, Mary, you know, he said, Booker, we have to be better, don't we? He was a Jewish doctor. So then I ever, after that time, um, I decided to take everything that someone said to me as positive. So that if you asked me a question, it's because you wanted to show me off. And okay. not because you wanted to try to make me feel Inferior. relaxed. Right. So that worked very well. So then your attitude was very important. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. But that, re that really shocked me. It taught me a lesson because I had not thought of it. But he took me aside as we were, I don't leave, we were just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And he said, Booker, we have to be better, don't we? Well, you know, there, there's always this sort of notion that some ethnic groups have to prove themselves and excel that's right. more so than that's other right. people. And that's so I right. think that's what he was saying, I, yeah. I, I would imagine. Yeah, and I, I thought, well, bless your heart. You know, he, I mean, he <laughs> was nice. I always liked him anyway, sure. just as much as you'd like anybody. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I never thought of that kind of personal attention that he chose to give to me sure. because he said we have to be better don't we? Well it sounds if also he was giving you an opportunity to show that you were as yep. that you were good. Yeah I thought that was very nice. Yeah yeah. And it worked out well. Okay. That's sort of kind of what I went by. Well good good. Okay but now as you're growing up you know I know that you spent time at, at UT and at St. V's 
Um, but as you are growing up now as an adult, okay. what kinds of things are you doing? Well, I graduated in 51, and because I had a year of college, I finished the time three months early. Okay. So they give you credit for that, and there were not many students who had gone to college. Uh, which worked out well. And then I got married that same year. I got graduated in June and I got married in September. Okay. That worked out well. Okay. And by the way, one of my best friends wore my wedding dress when she got married. Really? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So you, you can make some very good bonds, very close bonds uh, while you're in a school like that. Sure. sure. But anyway, and she looked gorgeous, but I, we don't discuss that. I'm, I bet she did. I bet. <laughs> she did. <laughs> um, but yeah, I um, found that when I got married, I'm on my own, or you know, I'm, I have a husband now, we began having children and the first son was born three months after my first wedding anniversary. So okay. I was big as a barn for them. <laughs> um, ended up having two boys and then two girls. And the names? James is the oldest one. Okay. Uh, Chris is the second one, that's a boy. Okay. The girls were Leslie, and the youngest girl was Teresa. Okay, good. Okay. But those are the four. The four children. Yeah, okay. and the two boys were 14 months apart. I always wanted kids. I didn't have any sisters and brothers, so right, I always right. wanted kids. Okay. And I really always wanted at least four. Okay. So well, we were blessed. You achieved that. Oh yes, one way or another. <laughs> and I say it to say that I never stopped working. Okay. In fact, I worked on a Monday, and Chris was born Tuesday. He was early but I worked all the time that I was pregnant. And of course, obviously it helped pay the bills, no question about that. Sure. Um, but it was a very busy time. It was busy with the kids, trying to keep up with whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a very exciting time. My, my parents certainly enjoyed the kids. My oldest son was named after my dad. Okay. My oldest daughter was named after my mother. No, 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 the two boys. James and Chris. The oldest boy was named after my dad, and the youngest girl was named after my mother. Your mother. Well, I mean, she must have been very proud of you. Oh, yeah. There was no question of that, and people would tell me that, yeah. which I thought was... At, and I guess what I should say is that I don't think that it was a surprise, because we always had, again, a very special bond. Mm -hmm. um, and it, was, it was nice growing up with someone like her because she certainly was um, what you would call kind of, she would take me, I wanted to go to the dances, I like to dance, mm -hmm. and she would take me. Now my dad thought that was terrible. My dad was born in the South, okay. and young ladies just didn't go to dances, and I said, well, maybe not, <laughs> but that's what I wanted to do. She would take me. Really, okay. Oh yeah, okay. so that I was exposed to things on a very wide level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love to dance, dance my silly self crazy. <laughs> But it was an excellent time. It was also full of exercise because you're dancing hard. Okay. And so I met all of these black bands, you know, Cab Calloway and um, Nat King Cole. They all came to Toledo, and they had dances at the Civic Auditorium. Okay. So it gave you a chance to be exposed to a whole different level of people. But it was excellent. And like I said, my mother always went with me. Did she really? Oh, yes. Yeah, she loved to dance, too. Well, outside of your, your, your mother, who were some of your other close friends as my you were coming My mother's teachers. Now, I shouldn't say it that way. I told you my mother played bridge. Mm -hmm. She was an excellent bridge player. Mm -hmm. But she was also an, a person that was very easy to get along with. She did not argue. She did not fuss. She did not raise her voice. Okay. It was just the nature of her. Okay. So people liked her for a lot of reasons. And so she would play bridge. Okay. Now, you have to understand that when you play bridge, it's a different level of person that usually plays bridge. <laughs> so there were quite a few women's bridge clubs. Uh, they were doctor's wives. They were teachers. Mm -hmm. They were women of the community. But this was a sort of a separate social group. So she played bridge. She'd oftentimes get uh, asked to play if someone couldn't come in. Okay. Because people could get along with her, and she was an excellent player. Outside of your mother and the, the teachers. teachers. Teachers took you under their wings. Okay. At, at that time. At, yes. And can you think of any of the names of the people she played bridge with? Oh, sure. She's, well, um, there were, like I said, there were doctor's wives. Okay. There were school teachers whose hair she would do, maybe, or didn't. It didn't matter. Okay. Um, 
Yes, she played bridge. The, the Friday Nighters is a bridge club that's still going now. Is it really? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes, it is still going. And, you know, the children or whomever have joined in to take those who have died. Mm -hmm. Minnie Lou Pickett was a school teacher that uh, taught at Gunkel School. She was a good player. Uh, Gladys Heron, who was also a beautician. So you sort of kind of run in the same circles. Okay. Um, I can't even, brain is not working well. Today. But there's a network of people oh, the yes. way it sounds, oh, sort yes. of hung out together. Let me say this too, because I learned this very much later in my life. I don't know why they took me into the School of Nursing when they did. But I later learned that there were some doctors who were saying that, you know, you have to take someone in. There was a big deal. I didn't know that. So I don't know how I got in. Do you think? I know the NAACP was around and active. Yes. Do you think that somewhere... I'm pretty sure that the attorneys like Dr. Uh, like, um, attorney Simmons, one of our oldest attorneys, mm -hmm. I know that they were very active in the community. Mm -hmm. And I know that they were certainly out there trying to see if there could not be equity. Okay. So I, but I'm just saying, I cannot say that this one, that one, or the other one. But I know that there was more that had a hand in my getting into the school than just going in there saying, I want to go in. So, the, so then, in a sense, then, you're sort of an important history maker. Um, does it feel, I mean, at the time, I, I, I can imagine it didn't seem like it. No. Um, but now looking back on it, can you now realize that you are significant well, because Well, I you have been told that, plus I will see someone that will say, you're Miss Booker's daughter. And I'll say, I certainly am. Because they know me as her daughter. They know that I am a nurse, but I am her daughter first. So most of the time, the community knows me, especially people that I see on the street or something. Or mm -hmm. they'll say, I saw your picture in the paper, because mm -hmm. I've been very active all my life in the community doing health kinds of things. I was going to say, so, so once then, your, your career seems to have changed at some point, and you became more active in the community. Well, you have to understand that, again, when you're a student, you're living there at that hospital, and that's all you see, know, or do. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. get up and you go to bed there. Mm -hmm. And the only friends, quote, quote, friends that you have that you see are the ones that you're learning and working with. Sure. So if you're really kind of isolated, though you can, don't have to be that bad, but I'm just saying you're not out with your buddies and your friends. You're not on the phone every day talking to whomever. Okay. But again, as you look back at how things evolved, you learned things that you needed and wanted to do as even as a student at the time and you you don't remember this you're still too young but they would put the black patients in the hall rather than put them into a room with a white patient or they put a black patient on the ward that's just the way it was done really oh yes so those kinds of things after I graduated I could speak up about it okay. and I did Okay. I didn't bite my tongue, as a rule, um, because it just, to me, didn't make sense. And it wasn't right. It wasn't right to me. But that's the way it was. And I don't want to say that you accepted it, but the fact that you made sure that you could do whatever you could do. You made sure that they had whatever they needed in that hall. Mm -hmm. You made sure that you answered their calls if ever they came on. You made sure that you took care of your folks the very best that you could. So you became an advocate inside oh, yeah. the system. Oh, yeah. That's what you yeah, did. Yeah, that, that was not cool. So the ways things were are ways that you could not do a lot about it. You could do what you could do in your own little way, but that was not a lot. Okay. And that worked out really well. Okay, Ms. Craig, I know that in addition to, to being a nurse, you had varied work experiences in, yes. in the health profession. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I have to let you know that my life was not planned <laughs> and that things just happened to surface. I told you that I had gone to college before I went into nursing mm -hmm. and that that gave me a definite edge. Right. I began my work experience at St. Vincent in the emergency room and I was there for about a month or a month and a half and my classmate said to me, Mary, you can get weekends off in surgery. Okay. That's all I needed. That made a difference. That made, oh, yes, a big difference. <laughs> so I went up and applied, and I got a position working in the operating room. Okay. Now, I didn't plan that, okay, but that's where I spent my next 20 years, was in the operating room. 
I didn't just work in the operating room. First of all, I worked as a staff nurse. And I used to work as 3 to 11 because that was let my husband take care of the kids mm -hmm. after the evening and I could go to work in the morning. Okay. What happened is I, because I had had that year of college, the instructor for the students in the operating room was going to go on leave. Okay. And they wanted someone to take her place. Mm -hmm. And they asked if I would. Mm -hmm. And I, because it would look better that at least I had at least a year of college sure. if I was going to try to be, quote, a teacher too. Sure. So that began my year, my years of teaching in the operating room. I taught the student nurses in the operating room. And what happened is they came to the operating room for their classes and all. Okay. Now, they had to put on scrubs and work with the surgeries too. Okay. From there, and you may not remember when there was the manpower programs, which was funding programs to help people get trained. I, yeah, I remember okay. that. Okay. Remember that. Okay. Well, <laughs> somewhere there came an opportunity to have a class for surgical technicians. Okay. Now those were non-employed, under work, whatever they were doing, and needed to be qualified to get a training. It was a, fun, a full year program, 1,939 hours. I'll never forget that. <laughs> and so we had a, an addition onto the surgery, an empty room that was perfect for students. Okay. So we were, my, the nun that I worked under that I dearly loved, uh, wrote the, this grant for the surgical technician program. She got it. It was for two years. When she got the grant, she told me, she said, I want you to teach it. I thought, okay, here we go again. There had not been a surgical technician program that I had ever known about because that had not been a difference in the way surgery was being done. So there was no place else that had surgical technicians, so we had to develop the program. I did get another nurse who worked with me, so we did it together, and she was a very petite white nurse. And so here you saw me, and then you saw her. And you could always tell who was who. But anyway, and, and she was wonderful. We had a very good time. What we did is we took in students. You could take in a maximum of, 25, of 20 students. We took in 25. Okay. So that if students dropped out, there was another one to take that place. Sure. And that worked out very, very well. So okay. we always graduated at least 20 students. So now this program was how long? One full year. One full year. Started and ended the one year, and we had all the classes there in surgery. Now, you have to understand that nobody went to the hallowed halls of surgery but nurses and doctors. Mm -hmm. So who was this ragtag group of whoever <laughs> sitting up here in this classroom, and it happened to have a glass window around it. And so the students actually watched surgery? The students were taught how to assist in surgery. Okay which was, of course, unheard of at that time. So that was our task. But significantly, though, you, were, you headed that yeah. initiative. Yeah, that was my lot in life. Wow. Had a good time. That, it went really well. And by the grace of God, because it certainly wasn't planned, we took in half of them were black students and half of them were white students. Now, that was not planned out, but that's just the way. We had to get our applicants from the... Um, employment service. Mm -hmm. They had to be screened through them. Mm -hmm. We could choose the ones that we wanted. We set up pre-tests that we could give them to try to make sure that they were going to be able to finish it. And we did that well. We took out the, the grant for two years. Okay. We then, they added three more. Who, the the funding source. Funding source yeah. added three more years. Yes. We learned that it was one of the most successful uh, manpower programs that they had in the state of Ohio. And they were thrilled to death. Fine. Okay. Um, at the fifth year, we decided that we just needed to have more educational experiences for our students than we had time to teach. We were teaching surgery, mm -hmm. and that took all the time. Sure. So we gave up the program, and it went to Owens Tech, a two-year program. Okay. So that was fine. I served on the board. But... It worked out very well because it allowed the program to continue. I think the value of being able to teach people at a different level than just RNs or doctors mm -hmm. made it obvious that you needed to have a lot of auxiliary kinds of trained help. So is that the same program that's currently in existence? It is in existence now. Is in existence. Okay. And they are two-year programs. They are programs that teach a lot the same thing that we taught. Okay. But if the person 
in a university, if they are weak in certain areas, you can send them to another program to help them, you know, hone up their skills. Sure. We couldn't do that, all of those things at one place. Well, I think here, I think here again, here's another historic moment where you were instrumental in establishing that very important program. Oh, yes. Uh, the other thing that happened when, when they were in surgery as the professional students, mm -hmm. there was a big discussion about letting students not go to surgery, that you were so busy teaching them about instruments, mm -hmm. it wasn't patient-centered. Okay. So I had to write a whole different curriculum to show that it was patient-centered. And so the student would go get the patient for surgery and put the patient on the table. And they didn't leave that patient until the surgery began. So it was a complete turnaround as to how it had been being taught when I first took the program. Interesting. But they no, survived. What I'm thinking is, you know, and where we would be, where the hospital would have been had you not been admitted in well, the very beginning. Well, you have to, that's an excellent question, because I never forgot that I was the token. Sure. You can't. <laughs> how can you? But the hospital was always very gracious. They were always very nice. I don't have any complaints about any of them there, even if I was a token. Mm -hmm. Because when I left surgery is when sickle cell began to become noticed. Mm -hmm. And you know, black folks had sickle cell. Well, they had a program at St. Vincent where they were t doing sickle cell testing free of charge every weekend. So they needed someone to help out. Well, uh, you know, here I am, stupid. I helped out. <laughs> and I loved it, of course. Ended up writing a grant. And we got, uh, it went for three years. That was f wonderful for me. Sure. Because, number one, I met all of these phenomenal black physicians. Because you had to, with you being funded by the government, you mm -hmm. had certain places you had to go and things you had to do. And it was just, just a wonderful experience, I mm. thought. Sure. So after I left surgery, again, this is the hallowed halls of heaven, okay? Then I'm out in the street. Because if you're going to do sickle cell testing, you got to go where the patients are. And how'd you do that? Made appointments with different places okay. and went there okay. with my wares. Okay. So you and get back out in the community. You, so you, well, my point is, you're still out, you're active yeah. in the community. Oh, you, I was in the community. Because you, you, you could have probably just settled for oh, sure an office and just Oh, yeah, of, and nursing you know, was, a, there was a, a lot going on. Yeah. But I like the street because I'm working with my people. Now, don't forget, I'm in surgery, you're with 99%, you're with the Caucasian family. Mm -hmm. And the surge technicians, of course, whom they were always about half and half, mm -hmm. and they were wonderful. Sure. I just can't believe that they have retired. I mean, the students that I had have now gotten to be the age that they can retire. <laughs> but you're still very youthful. You're well, <laughs> it, it was wonderful because sure. I told them, even at the time, because I was going to school. Oh, I forgot to tell you that. I started going back to school because I wanted to end up finishing getting my degree. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to school, and the students are saying, what in the world are you going to school for? I said, because there's things that I need to learn. Well, they couldn't get that. They couldn't grasp <laughs> that. And I said, well, you're not going to just stop when you get out of this program. You're going to go on to be something else because you have the abilities. And anyway, we went through that. Learning is lifelong. That's right. So I'm happy to say that of those search texts, I know that there was at least two that were PhDs. They went on back and got their nursing degrees and their PhDs. Mm -hmm. And I know that there were those who did go on to enhance their education, which, of course, I will say I loved. Certainly. I told them, though, that they will never be anything but my students. And don't you forget it. <laughs> and I see them now. And it's delightful because they are just, uh, well, they were always wonderful people. But, but, but you know, sometimes, do you take the credit or do you give them the credit for it? Oh, they just couldn't have done it without me. Sure. <laughs> and I think the fact that they have, oh, the surgical technicians taught in the operating room, okay, in order to allow them to have much more uh, job opportunities. Mm -hmm. They also went to OB because there was sterile technique that was maximized there. We also sent them to the burn unit because that's a lot of uh, sterilization and sterile techniques had to be mastered. Mm -hmm. So with them, and we sent them to the emergency room. So we allowed our students to be well-trained for areas that really demanded their uh, surgical technician, their sterility skills. Sure. And so they're still there. They're working 3 to 11. They're working all different kinds of hours, and it's great. Really? 
and I love to see them when I, you know, anywhere. Sure, sure. But they, yeah, but it, you, it's you been mean, a lot. You have to feel proud of the fact that you oh, had yeah. some some role, some role in their that's success. Right. And, that's and kind of the thing that was also nice, like I said, there was always a lot of very positive um, publicity, even from the hospital. They would promote things that were going on. The next phase of my life, which is the one that I ended up with, was to get a position as manager of health promotion. That was about, I don't know, 70, 65, 70. Mm -hmm. That consisted of a van. There was a, a, um, an agreement between St. Vincent and Channel 13 mm -hmm. that there would be a van that would be fitted and equipped to go around about a 50 mile area of Ohio and Michigan and provide health screenings. Now back in those days, we knew about high blood pressure and some of those kinds of diseases that were killing us all disproportionately. Sure. But there was no way to really get out into the community where the hard to reach population would be. Mm -hmm. So we got this 30, 32, 36 foot van, wow. beautiful thing. And I think that St. V's paid them a dollar a year. So there's this great big sign on it that said, um, Health Promotion, St. Vincent Hospital, Channel 13. Okay. And that was a wonderful opportunity because uh, I used to go to the migrant camps and we would do screenings on the migrant camps. So we'd work with the state health offices to provide those kind of information for the kids mm -hmm. and the mothers and the adults too. Sure. That put me in the street secondary to sickle cell because I was already out there. Sure. That was a time when there was a lot of promotions going on about improving the health of minorities who had disproportionate amounts of illness from the majority population. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up wearing out that van, <laughs> I'm happy to say. <laughs> but it, and we but got it, a small one. But it put you out in the in community the, that's what one, I keep, once again. I'm not in the community, I'm in the street. In the street. Now to me that says a lot more because we used to go anywhere. You ask us to come, we would come and we would provide our services for you there, which says a lot more than you're in the community because we would be in the streets. Yeah, you're right, because I said community and you yeah, keep saying yeah. street. Right, so right, there's a, there's right. a difference, That's but I'm right. glad you're pointing that difference out. I think it was an ideal way and time to show how it could go out because otherwise if you couldn't come to the hospital, you just have to stay home and die. Mm -hmm. There weren't that many services in your home or in other places. So it made it much easier to talk to people. There was at that time way back that they were having this, American Heart Association had this health month, blood pressures. So we went to all of the predominantly minority locations, you know, like the Swainfield and wherever there were large populations and mm -hmm. we'd have these health fairs. Mm -hmm. So we could meet, greet, and talk to the clients face to face. Okay, because has there, why has there been a I think a tradition of, of African Americans not going to get health screenings. A lot of reasons. First of all, they don't trust y'all doctors. <laughs> they don't forget the Tuskegee situation. Certainly. They know all those that had been so badly treated in terms of allowed to die. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of distrust. It certainly is getting better, certainly. but there is not the trust there because they know what you've done in historically. Sure, but in this, in this particular time also, it was really bad though. I think oh, it's yes. gotten better over the years. Yes, it is. Yes, it but is. But I think now because of education and yep. they've seen more people they think they trust. Well, and they see the same ones oft times more times than once. Sure. And that always helps. Sure. Because sure. I had had men come up to me and talk about their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And they'd show me their card because we would give them a card and they're supposed to get more numbers put in as they get this checked and how important it is for them to take charge of their health. Sure. And for the first time, well, back in those times, we were beginning to get much more out in the community to talk about you. You can't talk about what the doctor said. I said, I don't care what the doctor said. What do you know? What do those numbers mean? Well, he said, no, what do the numbers mean? Now, I had just told them what they meant. <laughs> so they began to really come around, and if they, they would carry their card and say, here they are, and I said, excellent. I'd see them anywhere in the community, in the street, in the store, and they would come up and show me their cards, mm -hmm. which I was thrilled, because that meant that they were certainly paying attention and trying to learn more and more. Uh, for those blood pressure days, I remember sending one man to the hospital because his pressure was just that high really? that I was concerned that he was gonna make it to the next day. 
and then he began getting his blood pressure medication. I could see him anywhere, and he'd say, I got my card, I know what it is, it's coming down. I said, that's what I want to hear. Perfect. So I think the idea that you're out in the street where they are, it made a big difference as to how they saw you and heard what you had to say. Certainly, certainly. Because back in that time is also when the Black Nurses Association was formed. So that gave you a cadre of nurses who would be out there to help you with these kinds of things. Certainly, certainly. But well, it was fun. Well, again, it sounds as if you've had just a wonderful career. Oh, I have. Um, and, the, and, and the community has benefited from you tremendously, direct, not indirectly, but directly. Yeah, they have responded just so well. Oh, wow. yeah, that's true. Wow. Even now, since I'm retired and doing nothing, mm, <laughs> every um, April is Minority Health Month. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you, whether you know anything about there's a month for this and there's a month for that. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a Minority Health Month, and we, the goal is to put on health fairs throughout the city to welcome all of your neighbors. Sure. So, and for Minority Health Month, we had health fairs going on in the Hispanic and the Native American Indians, all of the other neighborhoods, too. So we just finished doing... Well, April just left, so we just finished with the Minority Health Month again. So uh, I thought you retired. I told you that. <laughs> and I say it to say that um, I don't know, what do you do? Well, I still do things like that. And that's pleasing, yeah. because you at least think that you have been able to have touched people that perhaps would have been missed. Well, I think you've done just an awesome job, <laughs> and this community has benefited tremendously uh, from your hard work, and, and I think you. Know, um, well, I think that I have been blessed because you can't know how good it feels when people do respond or they'll call. Or they'll say, I saw your name in the paper and you're that one. <laughs> and I say, Yes, that's and that's me. fine. Sure, sure. But the Black Nurses as a whole also is an organization that tries to take on the health disparities in the community. But it gives you a lot of opportunity. And what I wanted to say in the first place was that I can't say that in 10 years I wanted to do this and in 15 years I was going to do that. Things just happen to happen. So I recognize that I had been very much blessed to be able to respond and hopefully have a positive outcome. Well, I think you've, there have been many positive outcomes. I'm thinking what's significant, you did not allow adversity to stop no. you. You persevered. And, and, and again, I think, look at where you are now. And, yep. and so I think we're just, I think we're fortunate to have you. Um, Ms. Craig, as we begin to wrap up here, is there anything that we have not talked about that we should mention? Um, not that I can think of offhand, because I think that I like to try to think that I live the advantages and the pleasures and the blessings that have befalled me. I can't tell you that I plan this out. As you know, you young folks <laughs> plan your years and years. That was not my case. It was just that I was blessed with things that for whatever the reason, I was able to take advantage of. So I just think that the blessings come to me, however much I may have been able to give, that the blessings have been mine. Well, great. well let that be the last word. And once again, thank you ever so much for coming in and having this conversation with us. You're more than welcome. I want to thank you. You're welcome.